It's good to see you all this morning. You look tired. <laughs> Can't imagine why, however. I'm glad you're here. You'll be blessed. I'm blessed already. Annie Johnson Flint, I don't know if you've, you've heard of her, but she was born in New Jersey in 1866. She lost both parents when uh, she was six years old. She was adopted by a childless couple, brought up in a Christian home, and unfortunately afflicted with arthritis, which left her unable to walk and pursue her career as a concert pianist. She turned to poetry, and unbelievably, in her years, she wrote seven volumes of poetry. For more than 37 years, she was bedridden. Uh, do we have a picture of her? Um, <clears throat> I didn't take this myself, by the way. <laughs> I'm not that old. And scarcely went, a day went by without uh, pain in her joints, which had become rigid with arthritis. Now, she was still able to turn her head and uh, write a few lines at a time. But, but long before these years of helplessness, she had received an affirmation from God that he intended to glorify himself through her infirmity. Like, like Paul, she prayed that this thorn might be taken away, but she instead received from the Lord a promise that my grace is sufficient for you. And my power will be made known and perfect through your weakness. So she reached the place where she could actually say with Paul, most gladly will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. In later years, she was unable to open her hands. So she continued to compose her poetry by, by pounding her closed fists on the typewriter. D do you know what a typewriter is? Okay. She died in 1932. There was one amazing poem among many that she wrote that was set to music, and it was titled, He Giveth More Grace. And one verse goes like this. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love has no limits. His grace has no measure. His power no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and what? Giveth again. This should be really the heart cry of every Christian. But it also is the fountain from which our generosity flows. As the word was read to us in languages of the world today, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. My topic is the discipline of generosity, which almost seems like a, a contradiction, doesn't it? Um, I was going to say oxymoron, but I don't know what that means. Um, but remember the basic premise of our theme of spiritual disciplines, that they are not techniques whereby we produce a certain behavior by their practice, sort of like a behaviorist model of, of, of uh, theology, but really tools of the Holy Spirit to produce a transformation of our hearts. And therefore, if if we're not generous people like God, which we're not, naturally at least, then God will use the disciplines of generosity to shape us into generous people like Jesus. Now, the people of, of the Old Testament certainly had a place for thanksgiving and free will offerings in their worship of God, but most of their giving was governed by the law, uh, and it was uh, the tithe, and uh, most people consider that the tithe was 10% of their income. In reality, if you, the, most of you Old Testament scholars know that it was more like 25%, which nobody likes to talk about when they say, I'm a tither. Um, but when you come to the New Testament, what's fascinating to me is the church is never told to tithe. 
And here, here Paul was teaching uh, the Gentiles the rudiments of Christianity. He never, never mentioned tithe, not necessarily because it wasn't um, uh, the, the part of their custom, but because there was a new covenant, and the principle of the new covenant is one of the grace of God. And believing that, that, that God in Christ gives and gives and gives again. And that's why there's no talk um, in this passage in 2 Corinthians either 8 through 10 <clears throat> or in the whole New Testament about amount. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. To give freely and sacrificially. That's, that's the basis of New Testament giving. In fact, in this particular passage, eight through, uh, 6 through 9 of chapter 8, the word grace is mentioned three times. Paul considers generosity to be um, a, a, a very integral part of the ministry of the gospel. However, if Paul had not continued his teaching from 2 Corinthians 8 into 2 Corinthians 9, we, we would be left to think that, um, that generosity is a passionate, spontaneous act that responds to a specific need, kind of the special appeal type of giving. And I know as a pastor, I've had to make a number of those appeals, and people respond. It's amazing how people respond to that. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we find a perspective that we should really add to our growing understanding of generosity. Paul had asked the Corinthian church to consider giving an offering for the believers in the Jewish church at Jerusalem, a church that was beset by persecution and economic hardship. Um, Paul did not give a one-time emotionally-based appeal but he called for a regular weekly offering to be set aside over a course of an entire year so that there would be a large amount accumulated when he came to take that plus the Macedonian offering to the church in Jerusalem. Now, apparently, the Corinthians began well, but... Their year-long campaign for the poor kind of stuttered and ground to a halt. Their discipline giving, if I might add, uh, kind of came to, to nothing. Now, many reasons have been suggested why it stopped, it, all the way from uh, the fact that they had other things to worry about, like church discipline situations. Um, uh, some had problems with Paul's authority. And as a pastor, I realized that when you're in a uh, a fundraising mode in a church that a lot of people's attitudes toward the pastor comes out on the basis of what they don't give. So Paul probably was experiencing this. But not only this, there, there might have been something else. And that was that some of these Gentile Christians might not have wanted to reach out to the Jewish church in Jerusalem, a kind of reverse racism, because they had taken it on the chin so much from Jewish believers. And so... <clears throat> Paul was in Macedonia waiting for this project to be completed. And in chapter 9, verse 5, he told the church that he was sending Titus and, and a couple of unknown brothers, unknown to us, not to the church, obviously, who would help supervise the completion of the gift so that when he arrived, all would be ready. Now, what's interesting is that Paul was not questioning the intention of or readiness of the Corinthians to give. But he was challenging them to follow through on their commitments and to practice the discipline of generosity. That's just like us. We, we tend to give emotionally. We make a special appeal for people to give, and money comes in. It's amazing. I, I bet you I could make an appeal here today and take an offering, and money would come in, even though you don't have very much. That's just the way... We, we, we naturally are. I think it's, it's a reflection of the image of God, even though th that can go awry for us. But if an appeal is stretched out over a period of time, we grow desensitized to it and, and lose interest in it because, well, because we just are overcome by life and, and the ups and downs of our finances and, 
as well as our own personal biases. And so we end up being emotional givers and not discipline givers. So in, in verse 9 of, uh, verse nine of uh, 6 of chapter 9, Paul used an agricultural principle to help spur on the Corinthians. He said, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Simple. Don't read into it a financial technique. I give more, so God will give me more. No, that's, that's, that has been contorted and distorted. Um, but, but, but basically, what he, he's saying here is that the amount isn't so important as the nature of one's giving. Either phaidominos or eulogios, um, sparingly or with blessing, generously. That's what the word generously means, with blessing. Just like the physical principle of sowing and reaping by a farmer is that if we, if we give sparingly, we'll receive sparingly. Doesn't mean we won't receive, it's just we'll receive sparingly. If we give with blessing, generously, we will receive generously from the hand of a generous God. And therefore, the conclusion drawn by this principle is found in the next verse, in, in verse 7 of chapter 9, where Paul s speaks clearly about discipline, generosity. Each one, therefore, should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, but God loves a cheerful giver. Discipline, generosity should spring from what we have decided in our hearts. Literally, let each one do just as he has chosen to do before and still desires to do. In the Old Testament, a tithe of one's income was required. In the New Testament, we see that each Christian has the freedom to decide for himself the amount that he is to give. So it's not a matter of quota, it's a matter of the heart. And um, how God returns a blessing to you will, will correlate not to the amount you give, but the heart motive with which you give. Paul suggests some possible heart motives that God does not approve of. The disciplined giver should never give grudgingly. The word um, there means in pain or grief or sorrow, just the opposite of joy. Nor should the discipline giver give out of necessity, the word there meaning out of compulsion, violently forced. We should not give in response to pressure tactics. Now, have you ever been pressured into giving? I mean, I have. You know, when I get a call from my college? Oh, I'm not supposed to say that. Um, <laughs> I feel like, like I have to give, and, and, and I respond, not, not because it's a bad idea, but, but there's pressure there, and, and there's a bit of grudgingness and, and, uh, and, and necessity, and so I give money, and obligation is met, but there's no real feeling of joy that comes out of that particular gift, no blessing that I reap. In contrast, in verse 7, and you've already said this, that the discipline giver should be characterized by hilarity. That's the word that's used there. It's the only time this word is used in the entire New Testament. It can also be translated glad, simple word glad. And I use that because the English poet Carlyle said that when he was a boy, a beggar once came to his door when his parents were gone. And on a youthful impulse, he rushed into his bedroom and broke open his piggy bank. Um, I don't know if you from other cultures know what we mean by piggy bank, but that's the, you know, it's the shape of a pig, obviously. That's why we call it a piggy bank. And we put our little money in it. That's, that's, not, that's not what I do now, I, uh, but, but that's what I did when I was a, a little kid. Anyway, he broke open his piggy bank and gave the beggar everything. And he said that never before or since had he known such sheer happiness as at that moment of giving. Have you ever experienced that? 
the happiness, the joy of giving. By the way, I think generosity not only is talking about money, but I think about time. I think about abilities and skills. The sheer joy of giving your time to a friend, to someone who needs that, especially right now at this particular point in your semester. So the final question that might come that maybe is already brewing in your mind is, well, Chapel Mac, you know, and this is very natural. How do I know that this discipline giving won't undercut my very ability to take care of myself and my family? Well, in verse 9, uh, verse 8 of chapter 9, Paul says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. John Wesley preached a wonderful sermon on the use of money, and he said that the use of money, that money is, is the means by which God uses to take, provide for us and our families and for others. And there were three points to his sermon. Um, make all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Easy. You ought to read the sermon. Fantastic principles on stewardship. This is essential for us to grasp if we are to be generous givers. Christian Generosity can be open-handed, open-hearted, because it's based on the confidence in a, the abounding grace of God for his children. That the God who provided for us our salvation in Jesus Christ, out of the storehouse of riches in Christ, will provide all that we need. Why would God do what he did for us in Christ in providing an eternal inheritance for us in glory? and then not care about us until we get there. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him give us all things? But my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Is there something we don't understand here? Now, we may not have all we want or what the man or woman of the world considers essential, but the more... The more and more our hearts are changed by the grace of God, the less and less we desire and find our contentment in giving ourselves and our means to benefit others in the work of Christ. In other words, my heart is changed, not only in my desire to give, but also in what I desire, what I want. And in the same way, we will experience a confidence in God's supply in our own lives providing for our every need and supplying our deepest desire. As C.S. Lewis once said, he who has God and everything else has nothing more than God alone. Annie Johnson Flint did not have a life that most people would have chosen for themselves. But when she reached the end of her hoarded resources, she found her father's full giving was only begun. The modern English word generosity derives from the Latin word which means of noble birth. So our giving is not so much giving back to God for all that he has given to us, even though that's, that's a part of it. But God doesn't need what we have to give. Nor is our giving even based upon how thankful we are, even though that's a part of it. Certainly, but, but, but God's not grading us to prove our sincerity. But instead, I believe that our giving reflects our noble lineage, that we are the children of a generous king. We reflect him and his glory to this very stingy world. As Scott Hafeman have said that our giving is not a decision to participate in the projects of the church, but an expression of the fact that we are the church, and that we belong to God and to each other. So, as I finish, I want to encourage you. Uh, it, it's a challenge, but it's an encouragement, because there's no compulsion here. I would be a, a hypocrite if I really put the screws to you and took an offering this morning. But let me encourage you to set aside a certain amount 
Each week, each month, you determine the time frame as your offering to the Lord. As a part of your regular financial plan, as depleted as it might be, this, this has really been my pattern, and this is why I'm preaching on it, since I was in junior high school. Uh, my, my father taught it to me, and then when he died, the Holy Spirit took over and has continued this, this pattern in my own life to, to, to set aside a, a certain proportion of my income regularly for my church and supply for those people that I know who are in need. In times of plenty and in times of want. In other words, there is a discipline there. Now, it's not easy because I still feel the tug of my Silas Marner heart, for those of you who have read George Eliot's work, Silas Marner, this begrudging greediness and self-reliance which seeks to keep as much as possible to hoard all my acorns for myself and my security instead of trusting in the sufficiency of God's supply in my life. And therefore, such discipline giving has been a joyful experience for me because it has helped to loosen my miserly grip on my possessions. It has taught me the nature of willing sacrifice. But most of all, most of all, it has taught me that when I reach the end of my hoarded resources, that my Father's full giving has only begun. And it seems like I never want to get to the end of my resources, but when I do, that's when I really experience even more fully the generosity of God in my life. So, as your older brother in the Lord, I would encourage you to do this, and may God bless you as you hilariously and sacrificially bless others with your generosity, time, talent, and treasure. Let's pray. Father, I pray that, that, that you will help us by your Holy Spirit not to, to run out of here and forget your generosity to us and how you keep giving by your grace and that you will continue to supply our needs according to your riches. And may we recognize our noble lineage in being a son or daughter of the living, generous God by reflecting that generosity in a cheerful as well as disciplined manner. Help us, we pray, for the sake of your church and for the sake of the kingdom of God worldwide, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of the day. <clears throat>